Hey everybody and welcome to episode 1 of BSD Synergy entitled Who, What, When, Where, Why BSD. So let's start off with who. My name is Mason Egger and I'm currently employed as a software engineer and a recent graduate of Texas State University. I am also a BSD enthusiast and a system administrator hobbyist. I will also be the host of this show. And who is this channel for? This channel is for everybody, but here's a group of people that we target the show for. People who are interested in the history of BSD, where it came from, how we got to the modern operating system. Beginners in the Nix world, whether it be Linux or Unix. System administrators, Linux users who have always been curious of the land outside of System D, you know, the one flowing with milk and honey. And of course, internet trolls, my favorite people, who want to fact check me on everything and criticize everything I do. And my only response to you wonderful people is, at least you're learning something. So let's get into the what section. What is this channel about? Well, it's about history, news, tutorials, and pretty much anything that I find relevant in the BSD world. This, is, this channel is geared more towards a beginner level. Um, there are lots of wonderful BSD podcasts out there that I really enjoy, but it's kind of like drinking from a fire hose. You're going to get your face blown off if you jump in too early. So this is more set for the beginner. We will cover some advanced topics in different places. What is BSD? BSD stands for the Berkeley Software Distribution, not the Berkeley System Distribution, as is the common myth. It is an original fork of AT&T Unix from Bell Laboratories. It's not quite like a Linux distro. The kernel and the user land began life in the same place, but eventually diverged. They also share code between projects and collaborate. BSD itself is no longer around, but there are four main forks that exist today. And these are FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, and Dragonfly BSD. Other popular distros are PFSense, which is a fork of FreeBSD designed to be a router or a firewall. Uh, PCBSD, which is another fork of FreeBSD that was designed to have an easy-to-use install and interface. OS X. When Steve Jobs was at Next, they forked FreeBSD and kind of developed some user land utilities around it. When he returned back to Apple, he brought the core of Next with him in the acquisition. And if you actually look in the Mac CLI, you can still see remnants of Next in there. And Mac is pretty much a FreeBSD-based terminal. There's FreeNAS, which is a FreeBSD network-attached storage operating system that is really, really nice. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to do an episode on FreeNAS later in the future. There's Juno OS, which is a fork of FreeBSD that was used as the OS for Juniper routers and switches. And there's also Sun OS, and we're not talking Solaris or Open Solaris, we're actually talking the original Sun OS developed by Sun Microsystems. So now to the portion where most people failed in high school and college, the history portion. If you don't want to listen to it, feel free to skip ahead, but I guarantee you you're missing out on some really cool things. And most people don't really know the history of Unix and how the modern operating system came to be. So, when did this happen? Ken Thompson who developed Unix at Bell Laboratories, took a sabbatical in 1975 and returned home to his alma mater of Berkeley and brought this nifty little thing called Unix with him. While there, Ken worked with Bill Joy working on tools and other little nifty things for the operating system, which Bill eventually packaged and distributed as the Berkeley software distribution. And here are the histories of the releases. There was one BSD, which actually, according to Dr. Marshall Kirk McCusick, is not really a thing, but that started in 1977. Um, there officially is no one BSD release. There was no centralized repository for this operating system. It really was the bits du jour of whatever Bill and everybody else had at the time. So people would send in a tape to Bill Joy and they would get a copy of the operating system and it would be whatever the state the current system happened to be at that time. Bill Joy is also the author of CSH, and this is where CSH begins. Oh, all hail the mighty sea shell. One of the first things that Dr. Marshall Kirk McCusick did once he got onto the project and around the time of the 2BSD release, decided that they were going to have a centralized repository for all of the source code for this thing. And they did. So this release of 2BSD happened in May of 1979, and it was written for the PDP-11. That piece of hardware is older than me, and I honestly have no idea what a PDP-11 is. Um, so that's really interesting. So not too long after the release of 2BSD, there was a VAX machine installed at Berkeley at roughly 1978. Um, the port of Unix to the VAX architecture, uh, Unix 32V, did not fully take advantage of VAX's virtual memory capabilities, so students of the Computer Science Research Group decided that they were going to port Unix and rewrite the kernel to support virtual memory. 
Thus, 3BSD was born. Uh, released roughly, it's kind of weird, it was released somewhat simul along the same side as 2BSD. The success of this release was a major factor in DARPA deciding to fund Berkeley's Computer Science Research Group. The success of 3BSD was actually a major factor in DARPA deciding to fund Berkeley's Computer Science Research Group, which was given the task of developing a standard Unix platform for the VLSI project. Next comes 4BSD, released in October of 1980. Uh, this was a pretty major release. It included some job control in CSH, deliver mail, which is the precursor to send mail, and curses, along with a whole bunch of other things. What was interesting, though, is the next release was not 5BSD, which was actually it was actually 4.1BSD, released in June 1981. Why not 5BSD, you ask? They were trying to avoid conflicts with AT&T's System 5. So around the time of the 4BSD era, more closer to 4.3 in the Net2 release, um, the AT&T BSD lawsuit came into action. I'm not going to cover that today. I will probably cover that in a separate video later down the road. Um, it's a really big topic that really requires a lot of work to be done on it. And this lawsuit is what actually finally pulled BSD out of the original Unix. Once BSD was, once this lawsuit was over with, there was no more original Unix code in the BSD release packages. The last distribution of BSD is 4.4 BSD Lite. And after that, the computer science research group was shut down and there was no more development on the BSD project. However, 4.3 BSD Net2 release is the pretty much the framework for all current BSD derivatives. FreeBSD and NetBSD are forks of the Net2 release. OpenBSD is actually a fork of NetBSD, and DragonflyBSD is a fork of FreeBSD. And now we get on to the where section. Where is BSD located, you ask? I have never heard of it in my life. Where is it? Well, it's actually in quite a few consumer-grade products. Um, one of the biggest ones that most people use on a day-to-day -day basis is Netflix. The entire infrastructure of the net of net of Netflix is built on FreeBSD. Also, WhatsApp is uh, built on FreeBSD. OS X, you know, like I mentioned earlier, is a common port of FreeBSD. And even the PlayStation 4 is running a modified version of FreeBSD. There's also a couple of other really big names like VeriSign, which is a domain registry and DNS infrastructure, and Yahoo are all BSD shops. Now, on the developer level, you're more likely to have run into some of these things. Uh, the ED and VI editor are all from the original BSD. CSH was written by Bill Joy while he was getting his PhD at Berkeley, even though he never finished it. Um, the Berkeley sockets, uh, the socket interface that we all program to connect to the internet through in C, uh, is a Berkeley a BSD based solution. Um, that goes into the TCP and IP wars, which there is a wonderful YouTube video of Kirk McCusick explaining that better than I ever could, mostly because he was actually there while it was happening, and I'll leave a link to that in the comments below. The BSD license came out of this, which is a wonderful license. I, it's, it's absolutely my favorite license. It basically says, leave my name on this code and don't blame me if it breaks. You can do whatever you want with it, but it's not my fault if you break it or if what I gave you breaks. BSD was also the first Unix to have virtual memory. Now, some of the other BSDs have actually contributed quite a lot to what we have dealt with today. And a lot of this is OpenBSD. OpenBSD really is known for setting the standard when it comes to some open source softwares. Um, things that OpenBSD have done, has done that you have definitely worked with are things like OpenSSH. Everybody uses SSH in the developer world. I, I've never met a developer who says, no, I've, I've never SSH'd into a server for development. Um, at least not in sysadmin land. LibreSSL, which is actually an alternative to OpenSSL um, that <laughs> coincidentally has never been broken like OpenSSL has. OpenBGPD is also another OpenBSD thing along with OpenSMTPD and PF, the BSD packet filter. And now you're asking yourself, well, oh man, all this stuff sounds really cool, but I still need to be convinced as to why to use this. Well, Here's some of the why, at least in my opinion. It, one, it's a free and open source software. We all love free and open source stuff. That's, you know, if you're on Linux, you're probably not there because you love Microsoft. You're probably there because you like the concept of free and open source software. Entire OS is licensed under the very reasonable BSD license, which I mentioned up above. Avoid the monoculture. You know, if you have an entire server farm of CentOS 7, you know, that works really well for you. But if you need to keep it a little bit heterogeneous for maybe failovers or stuff, maybe there's a zero day in... The Linux kernel that could potentially cripple you. Well, you know, keeping it mixed up, keeping some other things around 
means that not your your entire systems are not completely screwed when this kind of thing happens. Maybe you prefer the system as a whole model. One of the famous quotes that I've seen is BSD is designed where Linux is grown. You know, BSD is user land and the kernel. It's not taking the Linux kernel and packaging it in over here with Ubuntu or the Fedora user land or any of those things. Now, specifically, this one is for people that are already currently Linux users. Um, performance. FreeBSD is actually known for outperforming Linux in a lot of common benchmarks. I actually just read an article today where Fedora 23 is kind of pulling ahead of FreeBSD 10.3, which is exciting. I'm really excited for Linux land to, you know, start having some really good performance that's outperforming FreeBSD. I'm curious to see what FreeBSD 11 is going to do, and when that comes around, I think I'm going to be running some benchmarks of my own, and I'll definitely make a video about that. Another great thing about FreeBSD, at least, you know, all the BSDs, but FreeBSD in particular, is since Netflix is so heavily using um, FreeBSD for you know, their infrastructure, they actually do contribute back to the free, for, to FreeBSD and they really help on the network side of things. So the network stack in FreeBSD is getting amazing amount of support from a company that really has to deal with more bandwidth than most of us will ever probably deal with in our lives. And if you are one of those people that deals with massive amount of bandwidth, take me with you. It sounds like fun. You know, another good reason is, you know, you want to try something different. And then another funny one is that you hate system D and you don't want to deal with system D anymore. I promise you there's no system D in BSD land. And that wraps up our show today. Thank you for watching. Um, I understand that a BSD channel is probably not going to be the most popular thing on YouTube, but you know, I'm doing this for myself, for y'all so that people that want to be able to learn about BSD actually have the opportunity to go and find some resources of somebody actually talking to them. Sometimes uh, documentation can be a little bit boring, and hopefully you enjoy my witty sense of humor or whatever, or, you know, maybe you just want to make fun of me. It's up to you. I don't really care. But I hope that, you know, by watching, you're learning something. Um, I'm going to try to get on a regular release schedule soon. Uh, I currently, I'm actually speaking at the Texas Linux Festival this weekend, so when I normally would be making these videos, I'm actually going to be busy at a conference. I'm going to try to have one up soon. Um, but we'll see what happens. Um, I'm probably going to be shooting for a release days of Mondays, usually normally because I can work on this on the weekends and then I can upload it and it'll all be good. And then I don't really have to, I can spend the week writing my script and getting it fact check. And yes, for those of you that are, you know, oh, he's making this up. I do get this stuff fact checked. Uh, so if you fool all like five of us, congratulations, you know, you get a cookie. I, I may mail you a cookie. I'm not mailing you a cookie. The next episode could be up as early as the 11th, but as late as the 18th. It really does just depend if I actually have time to work on it this weekend, but don't dismay. There will be much more BSD in your future, uh, assuming that you come back to the channel. If you like the video, click the like button. And if you are interested in continuing to hear me talk about BSD, go ahead and subscribe. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Uh, I'll actually probably really like it. If you have any show ideas or things that you want me to cover, I currently, uh, I didn't start this channel with without a plan. I started, I have a list of about 20 or 30 topics that I definitely want to cover. Um, but I'm once I run out of those topics, I'm going to be out of things to talk about. Probably not. I can always come up with something. But I would definitely want to know what you want to know about, and I'll make a video about it. So let me know. Just leave a link in the comments. So I just want to say again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.